it's October 3rd, 2023, right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning, good evening, wherever in the world you're watching from. It's Business Morning Live on Channels Television. Happy Independence Day to you as we celebrate 63 years after gaining independence. Yes, we do have our challenges, but we definitely have a lot to be thankful for. Uh, let's start uh, counting our blessings, shall we? So uh, it's a packed uh, show today, but first let's take a look at um, the markets now starting the global oil market. We see oil prices dipped uh, in early trade today after falling to a three-week low in the previous session on a strengthening U.S. dollar and traders taking some money off the table uh, from last quarter's chunky gains. Brent futures for December delivery uh, fell 34 cents, about 0.4 percent to $90.37 cents a barrel. U.S. WTI crude declined 29 cents to $88.53 uh, per barrel, both of them losing the 90 um, dollar range. On Monday, the U.S. dollar rose to a 10-month high against a basket of major peers after the U.S. government avoided a partial shutdown and economic data fueled um, expectations. The Federal Reserve will keep rates higher for longer, which could slow economic growth. And lack of investment in the oil industry poses danger to the global energy security and could send crude prices higher. And that's according to the head of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, Haitamal Guys. Uh, in an interview with journalists at an energy conference in Abu Dhabi, uh, the United Arab Emirates, the OPEC Secretary General said that underinvestment in the oil, uh, in oil and world's uh, oil market could also cause increase in the market's volatility as demand grows. His comments come out just a week after the International Energy Agency predicted that global demand for oil, natural gas, and coal could peak by 2030. However, the OPEC chief mentioned that a total investment of at least $12 trillion is needed in the global oil industry between now and 2045 to prevent a surge in energy prices. And uh, back here, the federal government says it has set a plan to help Nigerian startups raise their total yearly funding rounds to $5 billion by 2027. The Minister of Communications, Innovation and Digital Economy, Mr. Bosu Tijani, made this known in a document titled Accelerating Our Collective Prosperity Through Technical Efficiency, a strategic plan for the Federal Ministry of Communications, Innovation and Digital Economy. Tijani also noted that the country is hoping to increase the domiciliation of local technology startups uh, from 1% to 25% by 2027, increasing their benefits to the economy. A recent report by an African funding data insight firm uh, shows that Nigerian startups raised $1.2 billion last year despite scarce funding. And still in the spirit of our Independence Day celebration, let's uh, listen to what the president had to say about alleviating the sufferings of Nigerians due to uh, subsidy removal. Take a listen. On our talks with labor, business, and other stakeholders, we are introducing a provisional wage award increment to enhance the federal minimum wage without causing undue inflation. For the next six months, the average low-grade worker shall receive an additional 25,000 Naira per month. The new CNG conversion scheme will start coming in very soon, as all hands are on deck to fast-track the usual lengthy procurement process. We are also setting up training facilities and workshops across the nation to train and provide new opportunities for the transport operators and entrepreneurs. We are increasing investment in micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Commencing this month, the social safety net is being extended through the expansion of the cash transfer programs to an additional 15 million vulnerable households my administration shall always accord the highest priority to the safety of the people, inter-service collaboration and intelligence sharing have been enhanced. And definitely the president uh, definitely had a lot to say. Uh, he did uh, touch on a host of um, issues, even uh, 
touched a, a, a lot on uh, auto gas and uh, deploying um, those uh, kits uh, for use. Uh, to help us uh, make sense of all of this and uh, the charts the course uh, for the future. Now joining me is Mr. Paul Alaje, Senior Economist, uh, SPM Professionals, joining me from our budget studio. Uh, great to have you on the show. Happy Independence Day. Happy Independence Day. Good morning, and thank Fantastic. you so very much yeah, for I'm celebrating Independence Day all through um, this week, uh, uh, Mr. Alaje. So, yeah, um, first of all, let's uh, drill down the matters. Now, we're expecting strikes uh, to commence today, according to Labour, but now that uh, that has been called off, you see the Labour and federal government have reached an agreement. Um, are we out of the woods yet? Well, uh, Labour has said he's suspending the strike for about a month. So temporarily, we will have sigh of relief, but I hope this, of course, will be permanent. What federal government has done is to promise labor that from September salary, there will be a 35,000 naira increase across board. At first, it was low uh, worker, low grade worker. Now is across board, which I think labor feels it's better uh, for the sake of the growth of our nation. Because if that strike has started and it has been indefinite and we have experienced it for a month, you can be rest assured it will have tremendous negative impact. It will enroll between 5 to 6 percent of the Nigeria's GDP uh, because from the circular that was made uh, public, according to the Nigeria Labor Congress and TUC, key workers, which includes those in electricity, aviation, nursing, uh, health, education, they will all be affected. And you know, that's more like keeping Nigerians uh, on his knees. No forward movement, no backward, no reversal at all. So it is good news that at the end of the day, the federal government, the leadership of the country, and uh, those of the labor, TUC and NLC together, have been able to find a way to find um, a way to move forward. Of course, we have not found permanent solution yet, but it's, it's important that as we disagree, con uh, discussion and talks should continue. And what do I think? Uh, it makes labor from time to time to always ask for more revenue, more payment, more salaries, and not just for those in, private, in public sector, even for those in private sector. You need to look at the economy. And I like the conversation we're having today, charting a way forward. We need to look at our economy as holistic as possible. First, when a labor, a, 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 a member or staff of any organization earn money, on where do they spend their money? Education. Now, if the quality of education in public that appears to be cheaper is not good enough, then they will go to private. What has happened to most private school? School fees have been skyrocketing. Labor is still earning the same amount. We have seen what PMS has done, uh, fears to even those, I'm, I'm even referring to those that cannot afford, you know, to, 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 uh, to buy a car, that cannot afford a car. But they have to be at work anyway for them to earn, whether they are private sector or public sector. So that perhaps we need to do something about those key sectors. If quality of education is high or for the indigent, education is relatively free or affordable, and I say that with all sense of caution. If education is affordable, then there may be no need to look at education as a major component of what labor we spend money on. Transport, we have heard that uh, President have said there is going to be training for some persons, especially in this regard. It's important for us to start this urgently so that when labor come with argument, government can also provide a counter argument to say that, for instance, in the FCT, we have brought 700 luxurious buses, which of course we cover the key areas of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the FCT. The same with Lagos, the same in Port Harcourt, Sokoto, Kano, Kaduna, you know, Enugu, Eboi. Government may do the same. How do we make these CNG buses to spread over all over Nigeria? Because the real impact, major cost center that is taking a lot of money from everybody, the rich, the poor, and the middle class, is transport. So but if people have alternative, they will know that, yes, price of PMS is higher, but this CNG, before we started even converting our vehicles to it, let's see, is it dangerous with what government has brought? That become an example that so many people we want to look at. So you also need to look at health. How often are people attended to? We have seen a case that happened, you know, it was all over social media. A lady, allegedly, that was a victim 
of uh, one, one chance? Was she attended to? How often are health workers responding to patients? And what is happening generally within our health landscape? Can we, by extension, say we have confidence in health sector, we have confidence in education sector, we have confidence in transport sector, as well as infrastructure. So these are things that the president and his team must look at so that labor, anytime labor comes forward, we can say, we have uh, created opportunity in health sector. Health sector in Nigeria is perhaps the best in Africa and is competing with the rest of the world. Same with education. We will save over 1.7 trillion naira we spend to import education on annual basis. And it may even increase now with flotation of Naira. We also save the same of billions of dollars, or Naira, I beg your pardon, that we spend on health for health tourism. So if they're able to put this key sector together, and we have infrastructure going on, and we're able to address the elephant in the room, which is energy. What is energy? Electricity. Again, diesel, petrol, uh, PMS, I beg your pardon, Jet A1. If you are able to address energy issue, which of course is not uh, the least there, the last there, but not the least, is gas, the, the one we consume in our home. If you are able to address all of these, I can tell you the future will not only be good, but it also be great. Right. So, so much uh, to unpack there, uh, Mr. Alajan. Uh, still going back to the 35,000 hour um, increase uh, across board for, for federal workers. Um, can the government afford this, uh, you know, at this time? Hello, Mr. Alaji. I can hear you now, sir. Yes. OK, you can hear me now. Fantastic. So um, I'm, I'm still going back to the 35,000 hour increase across board for all um, federal workers. Definitely, we know the government is struggling with um, revenue issues at this time, with um, the, the, not uh, getting enough revenue from um, oil and other you know, sectors. Uh, can, can the government afford this um, 35,000 hour increase across board? Clearly, federal government can afford it. It will take a lot from federal government. Uh, but the question is, will the state government afford the same 35,000? Before now, we know that some states have found it very challenging to pay 30,000 minimum wage. To now increase this to 65,000 is a different ballgame. But government must also understand what we call the Parkinson's law, so that we don't create a crisis in future. Parkinson's law says when your income grows, your expenditure will grow with it. So if we start giving people 65,000, and in future we say it's only for six months, what happens? Are we going to say that some of the expenses that have grown and the, the living standards that they've maintained will forcefully want to bring it down? So government should start preparing on sustainability of this 65,000, or perhaps to champion the conversation of increasing minimum wage from 30,000 naira that it is to about 70 or 80,000 naira so that we don't have, we have some level of certainty in our system and we don't on one hand say today we are giving 30,000, 35,000 naira extra and tomorrow we are not. So I believe the federal government can do that. But I also believe that 10 out of the uh, 30, 37 subnationals can also afford the same. But what happens to the remaining 27? It's a different conversation entirely. We must not get to a point where subnational we want to borrow to pay salaries. It is going to, it is not going to, of course, all go well for, for, for the country. We understand that some subnationals, they are not able to even meet up with their debt crisis with uh, using their internally generated revenue. Government could also support by helping them to put structure, and I mean federal government now, by putting structure around their revenue streams, which I strongly believe we have the subnational to also push in terms of what they are paying uh, labor at the subnational level. And I, and, and, and I want to uh, project into the future. One of the reasons, I'm just guessing, why the labor, they say they are giving one month uh, suspension in their strife will be with subnational pay. Because I can tell you, if one state uh, do, uh, refuse to pay, you might see strike in such a state in the coming period. We have seen uh, the pattern, uh, the way uh, NLC and TUC behave. Over the years, this may be a strategy that they are waiting for or they are looking up to. Because both federal and state, even local government, which all of us are not talking about, we are all going to the same market, and the same should also apply to private sector.
Right. I, I guess we, we need to keep our eyes now on the state government and local government um, uh, going forward. But definitely there have been painful reforms, you know, that are taken by the government from subsidy removal, uh, foreign exchange unification. We've had it must be endured by all as it's uh, supposed to be temporary. Uh, but what pain relief, you know, apart from the ones already mentioned, you know, by the president, should uh, we be given attention to right now? Okay, so everything will be, what, first of all, why do we need to take this pain, bitter, this bitter pain relief? You know, like drugs. Economy is so related to medicine. Why are we, why did we even come to a point where we need to start performing surgery on our economy? It is because of bad lifestyle. Over the years, we have a bad lifestyle, as is evident in corruption, as is evident in politicians who have given no regards to the overall economy, and we have seen evidence of bad governance, not investing in power sector, in education sector. We have seen the pattern of our budget over the years. It has been tri trickles that we have given to key sectors of the economy. So we now get to a point where a new president came on board and realized that last year, Almost 100% of revenue, almost, was spent to service there. It shows that there is no government at all. So what government did quickly is to promote two policies, to free up minimum of 7 trillion naira so that government can have money to spend. If not, government will be stranded. So with the support of international organization for Nigeria to make this policy, this policy came with a lot of uh, bitter taste in our mouth. But what must we do for us not to get there is to ensure that there is confidence. As I talk to you today, apparently, market. Exchange rate is still showing uh, some uh, level of uh, superiority to, to, to official rates. So, but what is the meaning of all of this? It shows that people have lost confidence in the currency of the country, and that is why they continue to patronize or to, to carry out some of this speculation on Naira. If you see education, most of the sector we have spoken about today, they are all conversation of confidence. But in economics, what does confidence mean? It simply means productivity. It means performance. Are we sure that Naira will perform? Are we sure that education will perform? For me to have confidence in it, if I have a new board of directors, of an organization. The, I expect that the new board of director we put policies in place to give shareholders confidence. If you have a student that you have confidence in, it is because the student is performing. It's not because of the height or the leg. If he's a footballer, yes, you can look at something, a basketballer. The same with a nation. How well are we performing? And for us to perform, one thing we must look out for is the productivity of our nation. Our GDP is not so much different from what you have in the UAE. Meanwhile, in the UAE, only less than 10 million people are sharing the resources. In Nigeria, over 220 million people are sharing almost similar resources. And that is why poverty seems to be to, to reign supreme here because of the number of what we are producing. So, so what government should do is everything that we make productivity higher. Remember that why we need productivity to increase is, is because it's even what you measure, you know, in your GDP and also because of confidence. So what should we do, Mr. President? As promised, 31st of July, 2023, that if we promote policy that we support small and medium-scale enterprises, those that we may assume should be in the middle class by supporting 100,000 of them with about 1 million naira. And I've since responded that, Mr. President, with out of 40 million people, if you can extend that number from 100 to a minimum of 1 million in the first batch and increase what you want to give them from 1 million or 2 million, but you can look at cap of 5 million. You cannot do that together because of reality of funding. But start looking at how you support that. When you look at the Nigeria GDP growth pattern of different three broad sectors, the agro sector that has remained flat, which of course shouldn't be, and you also look at the service sector that has been on the high, you know, as evident by transport and telco, telco infra. And if you look at the third one, which is the most critical, which is also why we are at this level today, which is manufacturing. We, as a nation, the largest population in the continent, our manufacturing sector cannot be nose diving. It has been like this for over the years. So how can government use this policy and support rather than just distributing it, wasting your grains all over the place without concentrating for it to grow? How can we now support those in manufacturing sector, especially? Those who are export-oriented, right. that we make the GDP not just to grow, which of course we measure our growth. It will also boost confidence in the economy. The foreign investors that have been looking, that we have been looking for all over the place to come to Nigeria, they will be willing to come. But you see, for all of this, if the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? The right. foundation is evident in energy. 
power supply must be relatively available. I'm not saying uh, provide 24 hours power supply, but for our factories, for our industry, for our manufacturing center, we must come up with this. Again, President Tunubu have taken some tough decisions, especially the two that are very popular and they are in the public domain. But we must also look at how we need to develop or work or make some correction on the national economic plan, that a development plan that the last administration are brought forward. Can we okay. look at that document again? What are the things that we, don't have we do not have mind to put so that we can take strong decisions, even though we may not benefit directly today, but in the near future, we can benefit from it. All of right. these will signal something. Reduce poor people we have in Nigeria. They will also reduce uh, unemployment we have in Nigeria. And if it is production, you can be sure that inflation will reduce. So in near, in near time, we expect inflation to grow simply because of uh, increase in salaries without increasing productivity. So that will be there for, for some time. I'm only hopeful that inflation will not get to 27 or 28 uh, percent before I'm definitely hopeful March too. 2024. Right. Uh, so, so much to unpack there, uh, Mr. Laja. And at the end of the day, Production, production, production. That's what we need to uh, enable going forward. Thank you so much. Always great having your perspectives. The Paul Alaje, Senior Economist, uh, SPM Professionals. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much for having me. Next, uh, we turn our attention to industries that have proven resilient, even with uh, macro issues. That's in a moment. This stay with us. This is Business Morning. Back as Nigeria commemorates its 63rd Independence Day, it's time to take stock of industries that have proven resilient. Uh, one is uh, Nigeria's entertainment industry, from our music to movies, comedy. Uh, celebrities in the entertainment industry have voiced their optimism for a brighter future, even in the face of the country's current economic challenges and other persistent issues. To help us uh, discuss this, we have uh, my very good friend, Godwin Tom, Managing Director, Sony Music uh, Publishing uh, Nigeria, joining me right here in the studio. Great to have you, Godwin. Thanks for having me, man. So, um, quite an incredible time. You know, we're 63. We've been through a lot, you know, as a country. We know the problems right now. Inflation at an all-time high. Uh, we have uh, our currency all-time low. So, the problems are many. But I want you to, you know, paint a picture of some of the gains, something we can celebrate about, about Nigeria. Um, well, we're definitely in a better place. Um, we have, the other day I was speaking to a gospel artist uh, who has made over $40,000 in the last year online, right, from music being streamed. So there are opportunities. But to put it in perspective, if you look at the revenue being generated in Africa from streaming. The African music industry is the highest, uh, has grown the highest, over 30%. Um, Nigeria contributes to a chunk of that. So there, there's good reason to be optimistic because artists are seeing money. Um, what we need to do is to ensure that it's spreading, not just the artists making money, but the industry making money. What's the, what's the value chain like? Um, so for now, um, that's where the problem is. So you see, as the diaspora grows, what happens is that there's, a, there's an increase in revenue for African artists. So the money goes directly to them, but first it has to go through the distro companies, which are mostly foreign. Uh, so they get, a, they get what's paid, what's left, and it's paid directly to the artist. The challenge with that is... There aren't many businesses, there aren't many artists treating their craft as a business. So it goes to personal accounts as opposed to going to companies and businesses that employ people and hire more people. Right. So that's, that's where there's a challenge, really. So uh, that means right now the value chain is not so big, but yeah. monies are going into different accounts. And you did mention um, some of these uh, companies abroad you know, that are also getting a chunk of this. Yeah. Um, how many do we have here in Nigeria that are also, you know, getting a good share, you know, of that market? Well, I represent Sony Music Publishing, right, for, for Nigeria and West Africa and East Africa. And one of the things that I've seen or that we've tried to do is introduce opportunities for local writers, local composers. Um, the bigger problem is most of these funds generated abroad are cross-board. So the music industry is divided into about 
five or six different industries. So you have the publishing industry, which is where I work. You have the recording industry, which is where labels are formed. You have the live music industry, which is where you perform the music that's created. Uh, and then you have the interactive, which is where technology meets. Then you have support services, like managers, accountants, lawyers. This chain is the industry, right? What people see uh, is the tip of the iceberg. You see an artist. But for every artist that is mildly successful, they create three to 10 jobs for the economy. What needs to happen to fix this problem is more people need to get educated so that they can set up businesses that cater to the needs of the artist. We don't have that many. We have maybe Mavens, we have Chocolate City, we have YBNO, which is signed to Empire. Then the number, it begins to dwindle from there. You start to struggle to see any form of structure around any other business. All right, talk to me about um, uh, record labels now and uh, most of these talents. There, there seems to be some kind of discontent, you know, either from the label or the artist. And it, it seems it's about money, you know, most of the time. What, what do you think is um, causing this and how is it impacting the music industry? Well, first of all, it's a global issue. It's not a Nigerian right. problem. Exactly. Um, so what happens is most of the artists who are creative come from environments that, you know, education isn't the focus, for lack of a better uh, description. And so they go into these deals hungry. They sign horrible deals. They ref some of them refuse. I know artists who lawyers have actually sat and said, here is how, don't sign this contract. And they're like, they're about to give me X amount of money. Why wouldn't I sign it? And they get stuck in problems. What happens is as the artist becomes more popular, hangs around more artists, has access to more lawyers, they begin to realize the situation they've put themselves in, and then they start causing trouble, most of the time with, <laughs> with court of public opinion. Um, but that's a general issue with people not reading their contracts, not hiring the right lawyers, not doing what they need to do before getting into the agreements. So empathy is what they hope for. Right, and just take for instance, I'm hungry, talents right now, I see a big deal, you know, in the offing, and I don't want to lose the deal. Yeah. What do I do? What do you do? Well, you build your own value. So what, what technology has given us now is direct access to the consumer. So we have our, our industry built around, you know, initially you needed to be signed to a label who would invest money. Now you can create music from your bedroom. You can put it on a music platform by yourself. You know, you can generate the income and put your accounts and get the money paid to you. Like the gospel artist I spoke about is an online platform. He put his music. One of the songs did well, and that's generating a chunk of money for him. He didn't need to talk to any label. In fact, he's not even signed, right? So you look at it from that perspective. Artists aren't willing to wait, and that's where the team and the business and the education comes in, to build an audience that will generate income for them. I'll put it in perspective. If an artist who has a million followers on social media can find 2,000 people who will give him 30,000 naira a year, that's 90 million. That's good money. That's good money, right? So it's taking the time to understand the process, building a value chain for yourself, and identifying those areas where you can How generate money. How expensive is it building a value chain for yourself? As I said, all the tools are available. To learn production, you can do that in your house. There are platforms where you can learn. To talk to the audience, you have social media, which you can direct them to your own platforms. To sell, you have platforms you can put the music on for free. So the chain is easy to develop. What happens as you grow as an artist and you begin to find ways to protect yourself because you can now afford them, you can get better lawyers, you can get a PR person, you can get more people to protect your interest. But to start, you don't need much. And let, let's take the conversation further now. Definitely, um, the Naira is under a lot of pressure, you know, right now. And, you know, looking at the music industry, you, you get a song, but the materials, what you use to produce, you know, that music, I believe most of those items are imported and definitely sends out a lot of dollars that we need out of the country. Are there any conversations about, you know, producing most of these items right here in Nigeria? I don't think the issue is where they're produced. I think the issue is how they're used. 
Nigeria is predominantly a production market. We need to become a production and revenue market. So there's too much. We're creating a lot, right? We need to protect that IP so that we can generate revenue and that money comes back to the economy. That's what needs to happen. So it's not about, I mean, some cars are made in Japan. Some cars are made in Germany. Right. The issue isn't where they're made. The issue is where they function and how they're used. And I think regardless of where they, I mean, we should have people who can develop and create those. But until we get there, how do we ensure that these materials that are available can generate income that comes back into the economy, that services the economy and creates jobs? That, I think that should be the focus. Right. So um, uh, at, at this point, definitely music has uh, grown, definitely in Nigeria. What are you seeing, you know, for the next, uh, say, 10, 20 years? We've come a long way, definitely. What are you seeing, you know, going forward and how much, you know, revenue we can make and what the government should be doing right now to position, you know, that industry to, to gain even more? In the next 10 to 20 years, Africa is going to literally control the youth market. We would be the youngest, pop we're already the youngest, but we, if we continue at the birth rate that we have right now, we're going to be a large chunk of the world's youth. Creative endeavor comes from youth, right? And so what will happen is we will be generating more money. We will be in a position to negotiate better. But if we're not educated, if we don't have enough people for fill, filling seats and positions of influence within the industry, we will lose all that money. So what I think the government needs to do is start looking at a framework around how to protect our intellectual property. Because within, many people think it's just music that goes out. It's not just music. It's our culture. It's who we are. It's our language. So there are a lot of things that go with the music as it penetrates and permeates other economies and other countries. And I think what we can do is figure out how to protect that intellectual property, regardless of where it goes, so that it remains ours. Right now, a chunk of our biggest artists are signed to global labels. And so therefore, the revenue being generated is kept in those markets. If we're able to find local superstars developed by local businesses that are generating international and foreign currency and bringing it back into the business and funding activities locally, we're going to have an amazing opportunity. Live events will, will, will thrive. Uh, streaming will thrive. And the last thing I'd say is the government would need to be helpful. They've been helpful in ensuring high uh, local content on TV. That was a game changer. What needs to happen now is we need to protect the IP that is being played and ensure that it generates revenue. Protect the, right the IP to Thank ensure you. revenue generation. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, My very good friend, Gordon Tom, Imagine Director, Sony Music Publishing, um, Nigeria. Thank you so much for Thank coming on the show today. Me. All right, so we'll take a quick break. When we uh, come back, Commodities Market Update is next. Do stay with us. I see a lot of volatility in the global oil market. You see prices are down this morning. Let's talk to Victoria Momo, analyst, financial derivatives uh, company. Great to have you on the show, Victoria. Uh, thank you for having me, Ladi. Good morning. Yeah, so we're seeing prices um, down. They, they seem to be losing that $90 level. What's driving sentiment to the market today? Any support levels for um, oil prices in the near future? Uh, thank you very much for the question. So I'll uh, start by saying that, you know, oil prices have, you know, dropped below um, 90 dollars per barrel. And one of the reasons for this is actually the strong U.S. dollars, uh, which has triggered, um, you know, which has triggered people or investors to actually take advantage of the profit of um, higher oil prices. You know, before now, oil prices were you know, above $100 per barrel. And these investors actually took advantage of the high price and strong US dollar. Um, so they were able to actually sell off they are listening to not take advantage of uh, the profit, and this supported um, the decline in Brent prices. And don't forget that there are also concerns about uh, the interest rate hike by the U.S. Fed, which has been affecting uh, the demand for oil, and that is also weighing on the price of um, of oil. And then there is also the aspect of some other countries, uh, major countries like. 
the Eurozone, uh, Germany, and even in China, where recovery is actually slower than expected. So this is actually you know, weighing on the price of oil and has actually brought the price of oil below uh, the $90 per barrel. I mean, what this means for Nigeria is that uh, we could see you know, a decline in our you know, foreign exchange, in our earnings from oil. And um, uh, on the plus side, we could actually see you know, a reduction in the cost of importation because, again, oil prices are falling or have fallen down to um, below $90 per barrel. So this could actually, you know, reduce the cost of importation and in turn the money that will be spent on um, subsidy payments. Now, you know, when I saw, you know, Brent and WTI prices, you know, hitting um, highs in the short term, I was expecting natural gas will also, you know, pick up steam, but it, it seems like it's finding it hard. Uh, to rise above that $3 level? Uh, so basically, we would see that these oil prices could eventually still, you know, go back on track. And that is because we still have the aspect of tight supplies from Russia. Don't forget that there are oil production called, you know, OPEC has meeting in um, uh, on Wednesday. So uh, we could still see... Um, an increase in the price of this commodity in the near term. And uh, also for LNG, we also noticed that the prices also increased. And that is because there are robust supplies from countries like Norway, even in Australia, where the prices of, um, or where um, the strike has, you know, be called off and production has returned. So we've seen improved production of LNG. And this also, you know, as um, weighed on the LNG prices. Happening uh, with international uh, grains at this time. Well, so international grains, uh, we'll start by talking about the wheat prices, and um, that is because um, we're having, uh, we are seeing bargain hunting activities, and uh, before now, wheat prices actually uh, were declining due to ample supplies from Russia, and then we've seen investors, you know, taking advantage of the lower prices from wheat, and uh, this also, you know, um, increased the demand for wheat and also pushed the price of the commodity higher. And um, this basically the increase in price of wheat is actually, you know, um, not so good for Nigeria, given the fact that we import basically all our wheat into the country. So it means that we we'll, um, you know, have a higher cost of importation for wheat, and then the domestic prices of wheat and other wheat-related commodities would also increase, and this would also feed into food inflation and even inflation in general. All right, so um, for domestic commodities uh, now, we're seeing some movement. Uh, tell me what's happening with tomato, yam, uh, flour, and onions. So basically, there is a mixed movement um, among the commodities. Uh, one of, uh, would I say, the increase in some of the commodities is basically due to the fact that they are um, uh, imported commodities, or maybe most of their derivatives are actually, you know, imported. And then for the other aspect of it, we also see some of these commodities actually being influenced by seasonal factors. For example, the tomatoes, the yam, prices of tomatoes and yam actually have declined. And um, that is due to the fact that um, we are in um, the harvest, uh, this, this, this season, that we're in season of um, tomatoes and yam. So this is actually, you know, driving downwards the prices of uh, these commodities. And for other commodities that are imported into the country, we have the likes of flour. I mean, the prices have increased. And uh, this is due to, you know, the rising global prices of wheat and, um, you know, other commodities that are uh, being used to derive flour in the country. All right. Um, in the goodies uh, part there, we see cocoa prices. Uh, they're up about 3.69%. How does this impact uh, the Nigerian economy? I mean, if 3.6% or 3% actually is a good thing for Nigeria, consider the fact that we actually, in, we actually export cocoa. I mean, it's one of our uh, major agricultural export commodity. So the increase in price, first and foremost, is being driven by supply concerns for major producers like... Um, um, you know, Ivory Coast, Ghana. So there is this blackboard disease that is actually affecting, you know, cocoa production as well as the supply of the commodity. And that is um, driving the prices up. So, I mean, when prices are increasing, it means there will be, you know, increase in export earnings from cocoa as well as the farmers that produce cocoa here in Nigeria. We can see increase in uh, the income of um, the farmers. 
All right, let's look at the currency market now. We, we're definitely uh, looking for more dollars, and cocoa price is going up. Uh, that means, you know, more dollars. But we're seeing um, volatility there. We're seeing a uh, gain in the official window, about 4.96%. Uh, but the parallel market still looks uh, quite uh, um, pressured. What are you seeing? Uh, I mean, uh, parallel market rates has you know, crossed the 1,000 euro per dollar benchmark. And there are a whole lot of factors that, you know, contributed to that one of which is the inflow of dollars. And um, that is due to the fact that we still have limited foreign exchange earnings from you know, our foreign investment. Uh, foreign investors are basically skeptical, uh, considering the uncertainties that are currently pervading the macroeconomic environment here in Nigeria. So there is like some sort of hold back on, for, on investment into Nigeria, and that is affecting the foreign inflows into the country. And when there is a decline in um, when the forex inflows into the country, it limits the ability of the CBN to defend the Naira, and that is why we are seeing that the Naira has continued to crash, you know, below 1,000, uh, above 1,000 dollars, and that uh, 1,000 Naira per dollars. And I mean, that is actually a bad one um, because this could actually fuel inflation in uh, the coming months. I mean, inflation numbers will be released next month, and we are likely to see the impact of Naira play out into right. the inflation numbers. And don't forget that there are still energy prices that are rising. Also, we we recently heard that um, uh, I mean the tax on the VAT on diesel prices have been okay. have been removed, but we are unlikely to see a difference, a major difference in the price. Diesel as of today, diesel was still sold above 1,000 1, naira per liter, and uh, that is because we still have global oil prices still rising, so we would not see basically that impact in the price of diesel. Right, as oil prices stay elevated in the global market, definitely still um, pressure at the pumps. Thank you so much, uh, Victoria Momo, analyst, financial derivatives company. Thank you for having me. I'll take a quick moment. Any on that side, happy independence. Yeah. I, wanna, I wanted to say welcome from the holiday. Then I remembered I saw you yesterday. Yeah, we were, so, we were here together. So um, it's uh, no holiday for you. Yeah, no uh, holiday. But anyways, it's happy 63rd anniversary yes. of independence. In and the I country. did notice something, you know, we're 63. Yeah. And the all share index is at 66. <laughs> So is that coincidence? 60 level. That's 60 is common. Oh, come on. We can do better than that. So right. how, how old is South Africa again? Oh, wow. Because they're around 78. Right. So, so they're, you wow, know, so okay. we just have to do better. I mean, right. let's, let's leave the numbers. Let's leave the numbers. Do better. <laughs> All right. Okay. So now let's head to the markets. Now look at, obviously, yesterday was a closed, markets were closed yesterday for the holiday, the um, Independence Day anniversary uh, yesterday. And so what the numbers we have is obviously for last week, we see it was a profit-taking week last week, and the market closed, uh, losing almost 1.5%. Well, uh, the suspects uh, for this were Bois Cement. There was profit-taking of 11.9% on Bois Cement. MTN Nigeria, of course, another major market mover, also contributed largely to this. Uh, Month-to-date and year-to-date return settled. Uh, Month-to-date is down now, about 3%. While year to date is still in the positive 29.5%, and the year is getting to the end. We've just started the last quarter. So, this is the final time you have to make your money, you know, for this year before we move over to next year. Uh, volume dropped. Yeah, there you have it. Volume dropped uh, more than 65% for the week and closed at 1.33 billion naira. Value also dropped, also almost half a percent. Uh, last week, profit taking was really huge. Uh, I don't know what's driving that, uh, but I mean, I know that uh, Ladi spoke to Victoria Momo and she talked about the fear of especially foreign investors coming into the country. But we do know that the equities market in Nigeria is majorly dominated by local investors, uh, which is safer, but of course we still need that FX. Uh, there you have the equities, um, the sectors. Banking was in the red. That, that moves easily, you know. Uh, consumer goods was, however, positive. Industrial, so it's like, you know, just going around. Insurance, we've noticed, has uh, even though the attention it's been getting from investors has kind of waned a bit, but it, it closed positive last week. Oil and gas was negative. We have uh, 
joining us uh, to tell us. Mr. Momo uh, joins us uh, from TRW Stockbrokers. Uh, we're starting a new quarter, so it's a good time to do a little bit of retrospect and then look forward a bit at expectations. Good morning, Mr. Momo. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. So, uh, hello, can you hear me? I okay, can hear you. you. Yes. I can hear you. Yes. So, in in a few words, uh, how would you describe the first three quarters just ended, just before we get into this final one? Fantastic, um, unexpected. That's the word to use. Um, Fantastic, unexpected. That sounds like a positive and yes. a negative. Yes, let me tell you why. Um, the market, I mean, how many markets does about 20 something thousand points in a year? A normal market does about 5% to max, let's say 10%. So, this rally, I mean, this rally has really done well for the market this year. And again, this um, rally, we didn't expect this rally to have broken an all-time high of, 2000 and, of 2008. So that's why I said unexpected. It's been superb. It's been a very good ride. And, um, so so is the ride I'm over, gonna, Mr. I'm Momo? Gonna... Is the ride over? Hello? Is the ride over for the it's last not quarter? Over. It's not over, but what we are seeing more now is more of a correction. Okay. Um, what we saw, the month of september what happened is that all what we gained in august september took it back so we are starting all over again um the only good news is that october seems to have started well most of the indices are in green have to speak um it needs to be we are in a stage where um as i list of people we only have two players in the market in the All right, so it looks like we've lost uh, Mr. Abdul Rashid Momo right there. Yeah. So uh, we know oh, okay. uh, dividend. So I think clients are. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I, I you lost you for a bit, but I can hear you. Okay. So what I'm saying is that as it is now, the market is doing more of correction. What we lost, what we gained in the period of August is what we lost in the period of um, September. But October seems to have started on a good note most of the indexes are on the positive note and i said uh, again um we are seeing some key support levels um for the index we expected about 66,120, which we saw on friday and there was a rebound within that level so for now 66,120 seems to be a very strong support level okay. for the market this was the level which the market actually it in um, September before we saw that um, rally up to about 68,000 points. Mm. All right, maybe so, another uh, another now, rally. The is going down. Another rally to close the year. That that would be a good way to end the year. But thank you so much, Mr. Rashid Momo, for giving us your views and of course giving us tips on how thank the market you. is doing at this time. Thank you and have a great trading day. Thank you very much. Yep. All right, so Ladi, that's very optimistic. Uh, yeah. The NGX is trading green at this time. We're happy to hear that, but we hope no negative surprises. Right, you even know? though we've seen profit taking already. Exactly. You know, ending the quarter, but let's yeah, see what happens. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, last week was really heavy on profit taking. We hope to see. Maybe uh, it might be a bullish was... fourth quarter. Maybe, just maybe. Maybe, to make Christmas. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah, Eli. All right, let's look at all the markets now. Definitely, we know the crypto market. That one um, doesn't sleep. Uh, but it's all red, you know, even though we saw that big rally uh, with Bitcoin there. It did touch 28,500, but it's lost that now. Big drop, 1.5%. Ethereum uh, down about 3.17%. Let's look at the uh, sentiment in the market now. It's uh, neutral. So... Traders are not afraid, and they're not bullish at this point. So it's neutral 50 points just right there um, in the middle. Let's look at the top cryptocurrencies we track. Uh, we see uh, Binance there, BNB 214, also lost a uh, big chunk there, 1.66%.
Ethereum, 1,006, uh, down 3.17%, bigger drop uh, than what we have with Bitcoin at 1.50%. And we see XRP, even though it's still holding this 50 cents um, level, did have a big drop, 2.43%. Uh, Let's look at the top gainers now. Let's see who's topping that counter. BSV there, uh, 15%, double digit gain, $41.03. Um, Gala, that's for the Metaverse uh, platform there, one cent, um, up 3.42%. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's still about Nigeria at, uh, at 63. Uh, we've seen, you know, blockchain technology come into uh, the picture maybe about the past seven years or so. So let's uh, bring in um, right now, we have Jude uh, Mozinegbe uh, joining me right, uh, right there via Zoom. Great to have you, Jude. Happy Independence. Thank you, Ladi. Happy Independence. Thanks for having me on board today. Fantastic. So, yeah, we're 63 now. We've seen blockchain, you know, and crypto gaining attention for the past uh, about seven or ten years now. What role do you see blockchain um, playing in Nigeria's future? Fantastic. Uh, so, over the years, we've seen, like you just said, uh, the role of blockchain, the growth of blockchain, and how it's uh, been pioneering businesses in Nigeria. Prior to this time, I mean, the sentiment of blockchain was towards crypto, but now we started seeing that blockchain can power many other industries. So that's given us hope that in a few years from now, we can see governments getting involved in blockchain, which has already started happening with the National Blockchain Strategy, uh, which is an offshoot, you know, of the national uh, start of uh, act. Also, we have seen private organizations looking at blockchain. We can have blockchain power agriculture that will also help in terms of logistics as well. And the entire value chain of agriculture can be streamlined using blockchain. Blockchain has a huge use case for medicine, uh, for pharmaceuticals, and many other things. We can see blockchain a lot in fintech, in remittances. Good thing government is embracing it, and that's why we saw the CBN introduce the central bank digital currency. So with that, there's a merchant side we know, and there's a user side. So with that, we can see a faster settlement time between banks, you know, between commercial banks and between the commercial banks and the central bank. A good thing to note that is that Nigeria is uh, about the first country, arguably, to have released a central bank digital currency. So we will see lots of blockchain activities in various industries and sectors coming years from now. Right, we'll definitely be, be looking forward to that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of volatility, you know, in the crypto market. Um, I'm hoping, you know, this volatility would make Nigerians poor. What do you think? Hello, Jude. Well, in, in every market, yes. I'm with you. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. I lost you for a bit, but I can hear you now. Okay, great. So like I was saying, in, in every market, there's always volatility, right? The the percentage or the extent of the volatility is, is what matters. So in the crypto market, it's not different because market forces must act on every player in the market. Yes, uh, for now, crypto may be a little bit volatile, but there are instruments to put in place right when trading in the crypto market it's not different from real estate it's not different from the foreign exchange market it's not different from other commodities markets right but when the right tools are put in place there are safety measures that can guide traders and players in that space from experiencing sharp losses right now crypto is not a tool that will make people poor if they understand the fundamental uh, approach to it is a tool that will bring financial inclusion. It's a tool that's able to reach the less banked. I don't usually say unbanked because people have banking services these days, just that those services may be um, not at par, right? So with crypto, there can be financial inclusion. Right. Now, it is when people approach crypto with a get-rich-quick scheme, and I always say that, that they get their fingers burned. And whenever they see a project, okay. it is too good to be true, obviously. So. All right. All right, Jude. <laughs> Thank you so much. So much to unpack there. We've definitely uh, oh, yeah. run out of time. Thank you so much, uh, Jude Ozinigbe. Uh, that's the CEO uh, right there, Cyberchain. Great. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the show today. Thank you.
All right, so uh, that's it uh, on the show today. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, don't forget, 1.30, we we'll have Business Incorporated. You get more updates and developments um, in the world of business. And don't forget, you can watch this again on our YouTube channel. Just flip over to YouTube, search for Channel Television, and you can watch all our production. Thank you again for watching. I'm Laddie Williams. Have a profitable day. Thank you.